Hi everyone, I'm glad you're here to join in our conversations with the Philippines' top industry leaders. It's time to pick their brilliant minds and see what makes them tick. Get ready to take down some notes as we talk about business, life, and everything in between. This is Clockwork. They say education is one's passport to a better future. Combined with hard work and a solid support system, there are no boundaries to what an educated man can achieve. Today, Clockwork features the story of a boy from the province, a farmer's son, who firmly believes that with education comes the ability to improve one's life and in turn, the lives of others and make the world better than the way it is today. Hi, I'm Edu Manzano and welcome to Clockwork. Today's guest is the Country Managing Director of Accenture Philippines, Mr. Lito Tayag. Lito's story begins in the farmlands of Pampanga, where his father, a farmer, worked hard to ensure that his children got the kind of education that could propel them further in life. Friends, please welcome Mr. Lito Tayag. Hello, good day, Edu. I'm very, very excited. I read a lot about you. I read a lot about your friends and family, and uh, I am excited. You grew up in Pampanga. Your father was a farmer. I mean, that early, your father was instilling uh, certain values in you already. Not just you, but also your brothers. Um, and he always felt in the importance of a good education. How did he impart that upon you? You know, when we were growing up, we will help my father during weekends on some menial jobs in, in the farm. During those times, he would actually tell us that he would teach us how to farm, but he did not want us to be farmers. He emphasized that for us to live better, more comfortable lives, we had to finish our studies. And he made it clear that as difficult as it was for him under his circumstances, he would do everything to get us there. So yes, early on, I, I maybe owing to our situation is that I have had always known the value of education. It's a very common Filipino trait. Father tells eldest son, you have to take care of your next sibling. And it goes down and goes down and goes down. Was that initially the structure of your family? Well, I was the eldest. So the answer is yes. The resources, the limited resources of the family would normally go to the eldest so that he could finish his studies and after finishing the studies he would be able to help the, the family the rest of the family you know to as well finish their studies so that that was the structure of our own family well you know now these days it's a kind of a different story altogether children don't exactly want to become farmers because it's not sexy but um i'm surprised that how he was able to put you in the right direction because i'm sure there was a lot of baggage on your shoulders because the great responsibility imparted upon you at such an early age? Well, yes. Uh, partly, again, as I said, is because I had a deep appreciation of the challenges my, what, that my father was uh, going through. He put in a lot of hard work. He would leave the house early morning and then he would be back until, until the evening. And with that came the realization that, you know, this is a difficult life. And uh, for whatever it's worth, I was gonna take the opportunity to improve our lives, even beyond farming, or maybe particularly beyond farming. Just like most farmers, we knew that education was the passport to getting a, a better life. And so studying was, was just part of the journey for me. But now that you're in school, how your parents did it, but they instilled in you the, the need to excel. So eventually from grade school, you went up to high school, and the Assumption teachers came, and uh, I understand that they had put a lot of hope in you. They saw something in you that maybe apparently your father did too. Um, I suppose so. Uh, maybe part is because I was a good student. Uh, and uh, as my uh, teachers, the, the sisters would tell me, I had to go beyond academics in order to succeed. And, and that is where early, early age as well, that I learned the lessons of leadership. Uh, one of the sisters, Mother Anna Maria, who was at that time my principal in high school and was the one who literally 
shoved me into leadership position to expose me to things beyond academics. And I think that's part of the overall education of, of the person and then part of positioning me, I suppose, to uh, opportunities beyond high school and, and going into college. There's, there's that saying that uh, to them who are deemed capable, much more is given. Because um, coming from your humble beginnings, and now not just trying to impress upon the Assumption sisters that this is the Kamale in terms of confidence in you, um, now they thrust you into other aspects of uh, uh, your being. And um, I'm sure after high school, uh, you were a scholar. And then now I'm sure you had to transition now to college, which is a different picture altogether. Right. Uh, what basically from your father did you bring with you in your backpack on the way to college? Well, it was still the same value of hard work that I saw. You know, when, when I went to college, um, you could imagine an uh, awkward provincial boy from Pampanga going to Ateneo, even under a scholarship, how different our worlds are. And therefore, I had to make a lot of adjustments in this uh, new environment. But it was also the, the values of, of hard work to make sure that I, I, I did my best to maintain my scholarship, but also the, the value of confidence in myself that despite being a farmer, there's a dignity to it. And, and therefore, being the son of the farmer carries with it the dignity even when I go to a school like Ateneo. I'm curious, was your father the kind of individual who you would do good work, you get a tap on the shoulder, or was he the type who it's never enough? You got to go drive harder, take it up another level. He, he was a cool dad and <laughs> he wasn't really that much demanding, but he showed more from his deeds than from his words. Even with his uh, being a farmer and his lack of education, he was also a, a, a farmer leader. And, and that is how probably I saw some of these things that I wanted as well to have in order to be successful. So to a large extent, even as a farmer, he was successful as a farmer. Lito, um, I would like to ask you this. When did you finally get that feeling, I belong? You know, there's always still that, that when you started school and then you get ended up in high school, then you ended up now in college. I mean, that breaking moment, you know, where you got out of the mold and you said, no, there's much I'm going to do. You know, I can, uh, I can take this all the way home. I don't know if I would call it like I belong. I, I guess it is I have the opportunity and I will take the opportunity with whatever I have, with a lot of diligence, with a lot of determination, because I knew I had something to offer that probably can be recognized and then later on will lead me to success. And, and that I saw it from high school, even from college, for example, and, and as I said, I couldn't really say I, I belong to in Ateneo, but I did know that I could be a good student in Ateneo. And then when I started my career, you know, the, the first thing that I had to do was actually to, to get a good job. But as, as I progressed my career, I, I also saw that I have the opportunity to succeed and this, um, you know, uh, good work that I'm doing would actually be recognized. You know, I'd like to talk about the uh, your transition. I mean, you came from student to now you're out in this crazy world, you're going to look for a job and uh, eventually uh, you already had uh, no doubt in your mind that you were going to succeed. But how was it when you first graduated and you made everybody proud, no doubt, um, but in college, who, uh, who shepherded you? Who do you think was your biggest influence when you were in college? In, in college, there, there's a priest, his name is Father Raul Bonoan. He was then the yeah, yeah. director of admission and aid. And he was the one who took the risk on someone like me to <laughs> offer a scholarship at the Ateneo. And he also happened to be a prefect in the dorm and, and the dorm was part of my scholarship. And he would come regularly to, to my room and mentor me and help me in every way. And, and he would always say, you know, we're praying for you and we're watching you and we have high hopes for you. So, and, and, and I would say that in, in Father Bonoan, 
is that I learned the meaning of stewardship. Now you're working. Um, now when you enter a company already as established as Accenture, what qualities or traits do you think a country managing director should possess to keep the company relevant to its, uh, let's say, clients and to its uh, employees? That's an interesting question. I started my career uh, in another technology company, uh, and, and that is where I built my foundation. So when I, when I joined Accenture, I hope that my background, my exposure, um, I had some value. And then when I was appointed the role of country managing director, I thought I needed three things, and I actually prayed for them. First, I thought I needed some wisdom to see around the corner where the company, where the industry is going, or where, even where technology was going. And then I thought I needed some courage to be able to make the hard decisions and to address inevitable changes or even crisis. And lastly, I thought I needed some humility to guard against myself so as not to get carried away. But more importantly as well is to be able to ask help when needed. So those are the three things that I thought I needed when I took on the role. I want to see how normal you are. What's the first thing you do in the morning, if you don't mind my asking? Uh, coffee before. Now I turn to Salabat. Uh, but of course, right after that is I, I have breakfast with my wife. And uh, during the pandemic, right after breakfast, we hear mass, virtual mass, of course, together. Would you rather be for, prefer to be in a business suit or a sports outfit? I actually have been wearing jeans and a sport coat. How about the beach or a farm? No question about that. The farm. I grew up there. Curious, does that farm exist till today? No, unfortunately not anymore. Because where, where we came from, it has been developed into uh, a, a village, uh, a subdivision. Sorry to hear. Okay, what is your favorite time of the day? Around 7 in the evening, nearing dinner with my family. What is the biggest obstacle you, uh, you faced in your trek to the top? I guess it was navigating different personalities in the organization. And, and I think that's, that's an important skill. Every day, for someone in your position, and more so uh, with the challenges of today, what motivates you to get up every day? I guess it's the opportunity to make a difference in whatever way. Through the years, Lito has been recognized for your leadership and genuine desire to improve the lives of your fellow Filipinos. When you first came into the, the company, what were the first things you felt you had to change? Having come from another, uh, if I'm not mistaken, having spent 15 years in another software company, what lessons did you learn over there? What the good practices did you learn over there that you wanted to bring over to your new position? You know, Accenture is a great company. When, when, I, when I joined and even when I took on the role, I don't think there was something that I wanted to change. But there are some things that I wanted to highlight. I believed in the Filipino talent and I thought that my priority or at least my focus was in highlighting and even showcasing the Filipino talent to the rest of the world through our global clients. And I wanted to make sure that Accenture Philippines was part of the overall direction and strategy of a multinational like Accenture. When you're asked to uh, deliver talks or speeches, you know, you have to always attribute yourself, your success, to the kind of education you got, and always to others who have inspired you and shaped you to become the better person that you are. Considering, for many, when they look at the concept of success, you're a poster boy. You know, you're the perfect poster boy. I hope you don't mind my saying. I came from humble beginnings and I like to brag about it too, but you would be perfect. To this day, you continue to feel that um, who you are today is a shared success. You couldn't have done it without uh, the others holding you on their shoulders. Absolutely, absolutely I do. There, there, I don't think anyone could claim success by himself, especially me. I will never claim the success, you know, that it's all due, due to me, to all my hard work. Along the way, there have always been people who inspired me and mentored me. And then as I went through my careers, there were many bosses who actually guided me and mentored me and provided inspiration. And I have to say, until now, there are still 
a lot of people who are helping me and guiding me in as, as I go through my role in Accenture. So when you first took on the role of country managing director, what kind of strategy did the company have and they were hoping that you would help them to develop? Accenture, as we always say, is a people company. And at the end of the day, our success is all dependent on our people. And so that, that is really part of my role. And that is still consistent with the strategy of Accenture. And this is to provide the best capabilities for our people. We want to provide them the best environment so that they could be successful. And along the way is that we hope that they could develop great careers and professional development. And of course, make a contribution to Accenture and to the country. In these trying times, many of those in the same industry have had to uh, either downsize or some have left the industry altogether. But here you are, Accenture, all guns blazing. You're still looking at your people. You're still looking at what, uh, how you can best serve the customer and your employees at the same time. Sir, what specific challenges did you have to overcome during this pandemic? At the start of the pandemic, we had to move very quickly to enable our people to work from home because otherwise we would not have been able to serve our clients. And if we were not able to serve our clients, we would not have been able to keep the jobs for our people. So that was the primary challenge. And, and I believe that we were able to do that with speed and scale and, and kept our people productive. And as the pandemic wore on, we had to provide more improvements to the new workplace, which is now the hope for most of our people. So we provided enablement uh, allowances for them to make their home a better and more conducive uh, working environment. We also, we are going to provide access to vaccines, not only to our employees, but also to their qualified dependents. For those few who have returned to the office, we also provide testing as well. And as we move along with the challenges of this pandemic, we want to make sure that we provide additional health coverage, including if necessary, uh, home treatment or even mental health facilities, for example, because sometimes mental health could be an issue during this time. Now, be, being a bit general, is that, I would like to ask you, how do you think Accenture and the ITBPM industry in general, again, has changed the way Filipinos think, uh, work and live, and how it's going to change the rest of our lives after the pandemic? Do you feel that there is still a lot of growth potential for the industry? Absolutely. You know, rapid changes in technology has changed and has continued to change the way the world works and lives. And Accenture and the IT BBM industry is in the center of this by helping our global clients do their digital transformation that have actually been accelerated because of the pandemic. And so as, as we move forward, uh, we need to be able to upskill our people to be in step with these changes in technology. And for us uh, to be able to do that is that we have to make investments in our people. And in so doing, we will continue to have the IT BPM industry to be one of the biggest generators of jobs and one of the biggest enablers of countryside development uh, because we, we provide services in cities outside of Metro Manila. And I always say we are also one of the biggest enablers of uh, inclusive growth because we hire a lot of our people, not only from private universities, but also from the public universities and bring as many of our people through quality jobs into the middle class. Well, Lito, uh, businesses again will try to kickstart their businesses once more. Once the gates, let's say, the gates of heaven are open after the pandemic. No, that's why it's always great that uh, everything is look, taken from the big picture. I mean, it has to be a partnership. Like you said, you're in partnership with your clients and your employees. But then, if you don't mind, mind my taking uh, a bit to the left, I mean, it's very, very important also that government come in in partnership also for the growth of a business. What do you feel now are some of these roadblocks that the business face with regards to government participation? In, in general, as we said, uh, even during the pandemic, 
at least our IT BPM industry, which is the only one I can probably speak of at this point, is that we have been able to provide and maintain the jobs that we have. As we move forward, we have the opportunity to continue to grow this industry and therefore to continue to create more jobs. We need the help of the government to continue to make investments as well in upskilling our people. Because as I said, rapid, rapid developments in technology is changing even the way we work and the kind of work that we do. And therefore we have to upskill our people. And it, we have to do this at scale. And the government will have to help us do this at scale by providing investments as well, or funding for this necessary uh, upskilling and even reskilling of many of our people. And of course, we also need a collaboration with the, the other sectors of government, including the Department of Education and also the, maybe TESDA and also the Commission on Higher Education in terms of collaborating for what type of skills that we need to build for the industry to be successful and for them to hit the ground running when they join the industry. And I guess we're also talking about maybe additional incentives for businesses to stay longer or maybe to bring in more investment and also, I guess, uh, the building of greater infrastructure. That's true, that's true as well. So aside from the talent, we have to get support from the government in building the infrastructure, uh, both connectivity, real estate, even transportation infrastructure, so that we can become very successful uh, for this particular industry. And as I say, I think this industry continues to have major contributions to the economy. You know, being a leader in one of the uh, biggest industries in the country, what advice can you give future and emerging leaders? You know, I'm, I'm not comfortable giving advice <laughs> to uh, leaders, but, but, if, but if I may, uh, let, let me try. That at the end of the day, I think leaders will have to go beyond the top and bottom line and look at the opportunity to bring value, not just the company, but also to our clients, to our people, to our communities, to our country and even to our environment. We call this being a responsible business with a 360 view of all the stakeholders. Now, before we go, we'd like to play a little game with you, Lito. It's called uh, One Word. Mechanics are very, very simple. We flash a photo on the screen and you give one word to describe what the photo means to you or how it makes you feel. No long explanation necessary simple straightforward one word answers ready here's the first picture mm, fast second picture ah dream okay our third picture is my dad it's only one word for that inspiration our fourth picture father bonoan i have to say thank you and two our words. fifth picture again two words there's to be give back i understand that's not just part of the CSR of uh, Accenture, but it's also a personal advocacy on your part. I guess it also shows that um, how you continue to stress the need for an education and uh, your daughters are witness to that. That's true, Edu. And, and as you said, education is an advocacy of mine. And again, you can understand from my background being a scholar. And actually for my high school, I want to share that I have come full circle. Uh, when I was studying, I was, of course, a beneficiary of the mission school of the Assumption. Today, I am the chairman of the board of trustees of, of the school. This is my way of giving back uh, for other children to have the same opportunity as, as I did. And I'm also in the board of three other schools in Pampanga and in Metro Manila. Great words. But before you go, some parting words to our viewers. Well, I, I guess I have to put this in the context of our current situation that uh, during these difficult times, whether as organizations or as individuals, we all need to step up our share in helping others and in helping our country. Okay, now you're not, you're not done yet. <laughs> don't, don't move, you know, because we prepared a special gift for you to just show you how much we appreciate you sharing your time with us. So I believe the gift is already with you. I yeah, know you yeah. haven't opened it. I'm not. Okay, so I'm going to ask you to please do the honors and open our little gift. Okay, I'm, I'm going to open it. Mm -hmm. It's pretty, pretty wrapped up uh, with, with a ribbon in particular. So, okay. <laughs> I, I, I find the ribbon myself. <laughs> there you go, that's why. Oh, here you go. Ooh, you're not Kapampanga, Edu, are you? 
Not even close. Yeah, that's so, right. We, but this is we had up. somebody who a uh, very familiar with cal uh, calligraphy expert, and we asked him what would be something we could give to a man like Mr. Lito Tayag. It's in Kapampangan. Yep. Would you mind translating it for us? Yeah, let me read it first because it's great. Even even in Kapampangan, it's 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 worded very nicely. It says, "Ing tanaman makilala ya karing kayang bunga." It means the tree will be known by its fruits. That's the rough translation I can make. And it's a beautiful translation. I can't thank you enough. Uh, you were very generous with your time and your wisdom. Friends, this is Mr. Lito Tayag, another name you should put in your list of heroes. Thank you, Edu. No, thank you, Lito. Thank you very much. I hope I get the chance to meet you in person, sir. Same here, same here. Thank you. Well, that's the end of our shift. But tune in again next time as we put the spotlight on another inspiring industry leader. Now, who knows, our next guest may just be the inspiration you need to soar even higher. So be sure to watch out for our next episodes dropping every month on YouTube and on Spotify. The clock is always ticking and every second counts. I'm Edu Bansado and this is Clockwork.